Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. We're so happy to see some familiar people and some new people today. And we also want to say hi to people who are watching on YouTube. Um, I'm Sarah Conrad. I'm a social psychologist at the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. And this year, I'm on sabbatical at the University of Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study. And I'm Victoria. And for those of you who have been following us, there has been a little change. I'm now a doctor in comparative literature and a PhD candidate at Indiana University Bloomington, and I work on transmedia and decision making in interactive fiction. So welcome everyone, I'm Fritz, um, and I guess we'll get introduced today anyway, so I don't need to say much about myself here, but just to say how um, happy we, uh, Sarah and I are for Victoria. She literally had her defense on Wednesday and we, we didn't even know whether she would be in the spirit here to join us today to talk about the good and bad side of empathy. Um, and we were having jokes about it, whether or not um, her empathy would be good or bad, depending on the outcome of the defense in the French university system after all. Um, and they take that dissertation defense very seriously, but they did it well and we're very happy about it. So we will, um, we are now at the, well, at the second half of our series of ethics of relating virtually. Um, we have another meeting scheduled for next week. We may even add more. We don't know, do not know that yet. And we'll talk about the next meeting for next week. We're very happy that Tan Cheng was able to uh, reschedule this meeting. The recordings will, for most of our events, will be posted on our YouTube channel. So you can find them, just Google it. Um, it will be available. Um, not all of them will be available though. Um, so in this series, we investigate the challenges digital media pose for developing positive relationships. And our focus here are young people. What does it mean to grow up in this new world of digital media um, and where digital media have kind of saved us through the pandemic in particular, but also in general beyond the, um, the pandemic. Digital media have many ethical effects by amplifying possible actions that impede on others by invisibilizing ethical concerns, by changing moral standards, and by critical mass effects that can connect extremists. Um, all of these can obviously play negative roles um, for our society and our world. But there's also a lot of positive factors of digital media. Um, they give us um, incredible opportunities to connect and to include people that have never been um, included the, in the way the, in, to such a degree before. So the, in the series, we have considered AI, narratives of the self, um, digital activism, the being, the fact of being in the world, and many facets of empathy. We're grateful to our sponsor, Lily Endowment, um, for making this exploration possible. Um, this is without them, this we could not have done this. So for today, we have, um, we'll talk, uh, we'll continue the discussion of empathy that Suzanne Keen started for us last week. Um, and that has popped up here and there in some of the other events before. And today we decided we'll try to put empathy um, on the kind of the, the judgment shell um, and debate the positive and the negative sides of empathy here. Um, yes, there are negative sides too. This will be my position that I will have to defend here. What we will do here is we'll, um, um, uh, um, Sarah and I will first, um, um, will first um, clarify our own positions here map out some fields and then go through a whole set of possible questions and start to debate the positive and the negative sides and impacts of empathy. And then we'll open it up to audience questions. And for the audience questions, again, you can use the chat function or the Q&A function. It will reach us the one or the other way. Um, Victoria has um, kindly agreed to, to handle them. Um, and if you, when you put something in there, please indicate whether you want to say your question aloud. There's a way for us to call you into the webinar here or whether we should just read it. And if your question is directed at the one or the other of us, then please just indicate that too. Then we don't always have to weigh in um, at both times here. Okay, well, okay, let this let the show begin here. Um, and this means that it's my great pleasure 
to introduce my uh, colleague and friend, at least before our debate, I can still say that, friend, no, friend Sarah Conrath, um, to you. Sarah is a social psychologist who directs the inter interdisciplinary program on empathy and altruism research at um, IUPUI, that's the Indiana University, and within that, the Indiana University, the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, I think, which serves the entire Indiana University system. Her lab has a beautiful abbreviation, the iPerlab.org. You can find it. It is a wonderful place of great resources um, on the research of empathy um, and also on the teaching of empathy. Very helpful. I've used it many times. Her research explores changes over time in social and emotional traits, such as empathy, among American young people. Um, she had also taken that to international and global comparisons. Other research examines implication of these traits for individuals themselves and for other people. For example, she has published extensively on the health and happiness benefits of empathy and giving. She also creates and evaluates empathy training programs for various programs, including young people, teachers, doctors, museums, nonprofit fundraisers, and many other organizations too. Sarah writes a popular Psychology Today blog and is regularly featured in media outlets, including the New York Times um, front page, the Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, NPR, CBC, BBC Radio, and so on. Her forthcoming book is called Culture of Burnout, American Life in an Age of Increasing Expectations. Um, that is a very timely book, of course. Um, and we all, of course, hope that is not driven by personal experience. She's currently visiting professor at the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study um, for the entire year. So she has been um, up in Notre Dame quite a bit, both still within Indiana. So she's, we feel like she's part of our uh, group here. Um, here's a one funny thing I need to say. This is, I had prepared some, I was thinking I would say something different here, but right before this event here, um, she asked me, so Fritz, how do you say your last name? Um, and this is funny because we've been friends for many years and this is the first time she actually is confronted to address me by my last name. So I, I'm saying that only to put a little of pressure on here so we all can listen to it, what she will try to produce here in terms of sounds now. So Very well there. served. Now I know what I'm in for today, Dr. Fritz Bryson. Did I get that right? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> but anyway, I'll work on it. Um, uh, it's funny because I'm actually a German citizen, and uh, but but through through my father, and uh, I have to apparently learn German still. Uh, anyway, he's a provost professor at Indiana University Bloomington, and a friend and wonderful colleague who teaches in cognitive science and Germanic studies. He's published so widely. His his what he writes is so impressive, but. On topics related to empathy, narrative cognition, intellectual history, German and European literature. And his latest book is called The Dark Sides of Empathy. Woo! So he's definitely the person to be on this panel today. Um, that was published in 2019. I think you can find it in, at any bookseller. Um, so this book discusses the many negative forms of behavior that can be motivated by empathy, from vampirism to polarization. So hopefully these topics come up today. He founded, he's a very interesting person because he actually has this multidisciplinary uh, perspective and experience in his, in his thinking and in his actual work. So he's founded and directed the Experimental Humanities Laboratory at Indiana University, which studies narratives and narrative cognition using empirical research methods. So with this solid foundation in humanities, it's very interesting to see what's coming from that lab. Um, his previous books focus on empathy, excuse making, the intellectual history of selfhood and many other topics. And he's a frequent contributor to the press uh, in the US, but also in the world. And just a funny thing about him this week when we were preparing for this, uh, he was sitting there with that beautiful bookshelf in the background ready to be on live BBC television. So this is just to give you a sense of who we're dealing with. I'm so excited to spend time with you today actually talking. <laughs> so um, we're going to first start with just briefly introducing who we are, what we think about some of these issues. And I think for me, the easiest thing to do is just to tell you some of the work that I've done. Um, Fritz re kind of gave an overview, so I'll, I'll dig a little deeper. So one of the topics that I focused on is changes over time in young people's uh, empathy and narcissism and other traits like that. Um, and I, people, a lot of people know my work, especially on the, uh, the research on rising narcissism and declining empathy from 
the late 70s to the to about 2009. So, so I found these declines in empathy. And at the time, I remember writing that I thought one of the reasons why these existed could have been because of the, the changes we saw in technology at that time. It, because they, but the changes we saw in empathy were especially strong after the year 2000. So we thought, we wondered whether maybe social media usage or other types of new technology, digital technology usage could be helping to contribute to this decline in young people. But actually, what's happened since then has been that, you know, I've seen some data that have persuaded me that I don't think social media are actually causing declines in empathy. Um, in fact, quite the reverse, I think there's some, there's some research that shows when you follow teens over time, those who are using more social media actually become more empathetic a year later. And this is really uh, important research. There's also new research finding that uh, looking at all the, all the published work on empathy and social media use finding that actually people who use social media tend to be a little more empathetic, despite what we might assume. And I think that makes sense if you think about the ways people often use it um, to engage with others. Particularly, we've seen that I think in this year, this pandemic year where we've had um, a lot of us have basically been in a long distance relationship with pretty much uh, most people we know outside of our household. And we've had to use technology to connect. Uh, so this is, I think, a year where this really tests the question of what technology can do to us and, and can it help us to develop our skills at caring for others and ways of appreciating and showing concern. Uh, I've also done some work where I've designed tools that help to develop empathy in young people, partly because I started, again, because I started reflecting on whether technology really is the cause of declines and also understanding that for young people, technology is such a huge part of their lives that I didn't think there was a useful position to just reject technology and just kind of, and, and especially because most adults also use it. And even if we criticize it, we're often um, doing that kind of not really authentically because we're often doing it via say, maybe we're on Twitter saying how technology is so bad or something. Um, I've seen a lot of that. Um, so the, the programs I've developed have been uh, using text messages to increase um, empathy empathic traits and behaviors in young people. And also I designed a smartphone app called Random App of Kindness to build, try to build empathy in young people. And um, in general, like, why would I want to build empathy in young people? Like, it's because overall, I see a lot of positive implication of empathy. And I think any negatives that we that we have um, that may be a result of empathy are, are not so worrisome that we should throw out the baby with the bathwater. So for example, empathy seems to be helpful in close relationships. It helps us to feel close and satisfied with others um, when, we're with, when we're interacting with empathic people. And um, it also motivates a number of different pro-social behaviors. It's one of the primary motivators of charitable giving and volunteering as well. Um, and also other kinds of just everyday helping that you might do for friends who need to move or maybe be a babysitter and so on. It's one of the major reasons people help. Um, it also has potential to help us understand people who are radically different than us. I see it as a bridge that can that can actually help us uh, expand the way that we see the world. Um, and it's not just that's not me being philosophical. That's I mean a lot of research has shown that when you put people in an empathic state, they are more likely to um, consider other people's feelings and and act on behalf of them. And finally, I think that, or there's research showing that empathy is also beneficial for the empathic person herself or himself. Um, find, I've done some work finding that empathy can be a buffer for stress. For example, when people are more empathic, they actually have a lower stress response, even when, I guess, an, a mean psychologist puts them in a stressful situation in the lab, like giving a speech, kind of unexpected speech that would be videotaped. So, so just finding that makes, makes me understand empathy in the sort of a physiological context that, that actually there's a system in our bodies that, it's, that empathy is part of that helps us to regulate our own emotions so we can care for others. Um, empathy also helps to reduce burnout, even though I think some people think it might cause burnout, but I'm sure that's a, a question that may come up um, when Fritz has some, some comments. And, and I just want to say a little jokingly though, Fritz, but, but he's a, such an empathetic person. He's really such a model of what it means to be empathetic. So I feel like, how can you be against empathy? 
Anyway, go ahead. I'm curious to hear what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for setting this up for me. Um, well, just even if I had empathy, would this mean that I have to appreciate it? There's lots of odd relationships you can have to yourself. But um, thank you. Thank you. I think um, um, Sarah gave us, um, and I mean, she only tipped here, the, 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 I mean, touched the tip of the iceberg here in terms of evidence that is out there that empathy is really an amazing um, capacity, ability, and a way to connect with the world. And my research starts actually with that assumption too. It's, uh, I would say empathy is not just a little sideshow in the human mind. Um, I believe there is very strong evidence that our brain developed, the human brain, um, to enable empathy. And it's because of empathy that we are not just kind of alone, that we are locked in in our mind. No, we, we are connected um, in many deep ways. We share our experiences with others. Um, um, and that's the, in that sense, th that is probably fairly unique in the realm of animals. So in that sense, I'm not doubting the importance of things we call empathy, not at all. What I do doubt is the battle cries that have come up, especially in the last 10 years, 20 years, that we basically just need to um, pour an empathy and a lot of practices and things will improve. Um, I wonder about that on several levels um, and I'll give you some more details in a second. Um, but I do wonder what happened with other forces that we often had positive hopes for. Um, this can be ethics. And ethics don't need um, empathy, uh, morality. Uh, it's also rational thinking um, and um, feelings of a we-ness, of a togetherness that of course, historically has often excluded others, but that can also be inclusive. So I am coming to this debate partly on the level that I wonder about this large champion, uh, this, this, this um, one-sided championing of empathy. Um, and I will give you now a couple of the reasons for how I work in, in this area and, um, and what kind of what it, uh, thoughts this has led me to or what kind of hesitations I, I have about empathy in many ways. This does not mean that I'm fully against empathy. I mean, I want to live in a world with more, not less empathy, but I also want to be very clear that we define certain borders and that people actively learn to use empathy because empathy has a lot of effects that I feel like very troublesome. So what I'm in, I mean, what I study is what I would call the mobility of consciousness. That's kind of my larger topic. And one empathy is one aspect of that. The other one is narrative thinking. So one of the definitions that I use of empathy and empathy has many definitions. I mean, there's the cognitive understanding of others. There is the empathic care for others. Um, but there's a third form, a more phenomenological one um, that I often use, which is the co-experiencing the situations of others. And that stresses um, one aspect that we can communicate even past experiences. We can participate, not just in things that happen life in the moment, but I can also imagine or someone can tell me what happened to them, what they went through. And that narrative sequence is a huge invitation for me to share, to understand what's going on there, but also experience, make the experience myself. Um, and actually making the experience that someone else made, not accurately the same identical one, it's not on that level, but there's something that sticks with us. With us. And that's amazing. So this is, first of all, this is a wonderful, fantastic ability that defines us. Where come in now on the, on the critical side, and I just hint at that because that's now um, where we'll come to a lot of these things. Is the first thing is here that um, empathy is something that we don't always use. It can overwhelm us. Um, it can lead in extreme cases to self-loss, which self-loss is of course a negative description. The positive one is self-transgression. You are in the life of other people. But there can also be the side that you feel like you're losing control of other yourself, that other people manipulate you, pull you over, exploit your empathy. And that is something where empathy kind of um, 
becomes one of the, uh, becomes too much. Um, many medical doctors, in particular, suffer from from that very severely. We know from um, many data sets from America, Holland, and other countries that there is this um, burnout syndrome for doctors. This is not saying that empathy here is bad, but it might be the temporal practice that they see too many patients too quickly, um, but it has severe effects of them. And I would say that is one of these effects of self-loss. Self-loss happens in other areas too. Um, lots of areas where the boss, the hostage taker, the professor, um, the, 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 the husband in the traditional marriage and so on, um, takes over for others and invites that kind of thing. So what I study now uh, is this balance of blocking empathy and inviting empathy nevertheless. And I think we all kind of channel empathy, but we don't channel it equally. Um, we favor some over others. And one of the, fact, um, the factors that I'm interested in is the side-taking dimension. Um, one of the strong, very strong triggers of empathy is that we see some tension or some conflict. And then we take a side. We often take the side intuitively. Um, it doesn't have to be based on necessarily an in-group bias, although that is a strong trend that we see similarity for us, but we can side with others. But once we take a side, and we are, as humans, we love to take sides. We're very quick at it. Um, we celebrate it in competitive sports. Um, then we see things from that perspective. And then suddenly the other side looks a little bit less good. Um, they are the, well, the enemies or the competitors and so on and so on. And that, that in some cases is harmless, but in many cases leads to strong effects of polarization can lead to hostility, I believe. I believe that the case of the sleeper cells and terrorism can be an effect of that that are partly fueled by empathy. So that doesn't mean that empathy is all bad but it, it evil easily gets entangled in practices that lead to truly bad um, outcomes. Um, especially in, in this case, also in a group kind of bias, there's a phenomenon called intergroup empathy bias, um, where empathy plays a less than positive roles. It's also a reason, and I just throw this out here, why um, I find the use of empathy and conflict resolution um, often suspicious and often tricky. Um, now, it doesn't mean that empathy cannot play a role in conflict resolution, but there's also good reasons to think that empathy can be warped up in ultimately supporting the one side over the other side. One side, I mean, if a side is better in showing their vulnerability and their emotions, they're likely to attract attention by others, bystander coordination, and suddenly the other side is left out there, even in those kind of processes. People are very good at warping things to make their own side look better at the end. Um, and many practices of conflict resolution, like truth and reconciliation that was used in South Africa, of course, avoid empathy. That's exactly not part of the mix. You put the truth on the table, and then it's decreed that is forgiven to you. And that's, there's something about that that works. It keeps emotions out of the table. To a large degree. Okay, I, 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 I don't want to use all my ammunition only here on side taking. I should mention briefly there's other things that um, that um, practices, and I just name a couple of them that where empathy plays a, a negative role. One is what I call vampiristic empathy, where people um, are drawn um, to others because they want to li vicariously live life through them, but then they start to manipulate them. If you're a fan from a far distance and you want to kind of imagine to be in the spotlight like your hero, it's one thing. But when, in the case of uh, helicopter parenting, this becomes different, where people literally become vampires and suck the light, life of their kids, take the decisions away from them because they want to co-experience a more happy, more successful, more protected childhood. Definitely not a very good thing. Um, even in cases of helping, which of course, every, when I talk about these dark sides, everyone at some point people tell me, Fritz, yeah, okay. But in the end, it is because of empathy that we help each other. Um, even there, I'm much more suspicious. And I feel like that we very often in all the wonderful acts of philanthropy and um, humanitarian aid, we actually, we, and I really say that in this large sense here, maybe I'm prone to it. Um, you can easily shoot back at that. Um, we may actually often just identify with the helper and hero 
and kind of have, well, will that have some filtered form of empathy that you imagine how it would be to be the helper, to be this, this positive person, but it's not necessarily empathy that is driving that. I think it's quite often more like the wish to be in the positive spotlight or to laud yourself um, that drives that. And that can lead ultimately to resentment or to negative feelings that can be short-lived when you don't get recognized for that. So I feel like there is some misunderstandings of the role that empathy plays in it, even though it drives positive effects that you can measure. I mean, yes, people are willing to give and donate, for example. But maybe this is this is um, plenty of cases here. Um, I, only on the final board here that uh, Sarah made, I want to add one comment about this here, which I call the selfishness of empathy. Um, Sarah mentioned that, yes, empathy is also good for the one who has empathy. I actually would flip this around and say, well, empathy is first of all good for the person with empathy. Whether other benefits is often dubious. Yes, I mean, I, we all know cases, of, of course, I mean, where empathy can save lives, literally save lives um, and make our world a better world. But I think the primary benef uh, person who benefits is the person with em em empathy. Um, Sarah indicated data that, yes, there's, um, uh, there's a chance of um, that people with higher levels of empathy are less likely to have a burnout. There might be exceptions, but that's, I, I believe that to be true. We know that people with higher levels of empathy become, um, have a longer life expectancy. Um, they are uh, more connected with people. And it's, of course, it's the cause and effects are not clear here. I don't want to say uh, empathy directly makes you live longer, um, but there are effects at place here that work. But I think that's actually the main thing here that the people with empathy live more than one life. They're connected. But the other ben others benefit from this. That's more murky. And that's why, why I would say that's where we have to be careful. We have to think about, we don't, we cannot forgive about ethics, about um, the rightness of behavior and rational choice. There is rational choice that is an important factor in it. Not cold choice, but we need to also um, cultivate other aspects of humanity. Yeah, I think that, that that's actually interesting because um, you're 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 so you're saying you think empathy is is you're not questioning whether it's good for the actual empathic person, right? But but you're questioning is this really gonna make the world better, right? Like I was claiming, and I guess my my take on that is like, well, why don't we just ask the other person? Why don't we? <laughs> like, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we do research and find out from the perspective of the receiver of empathy what it feels like? And there is research on this topic, actually. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting. It's uh, Jackie Vorera at Manitoba. Um, she, she's done some research where she looks at it, people interacting with each other, and one of them is more or less in, uh, empathic by, by trait. And she finds that, on average, the, the interaction partners, the recipients of that, that they feel pretty good in the interaction. They feel heard and understood and, and like it. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> there's a, there is a, an exception. So if people are, are asked to try to be empathic and it doesn't feel authentic, right? So if it feels like somebody's putting on this empathy and it's kind of a little fake, people, obviously recipients can, can recognize that. And I think maybe say in a volunteering context, it's possible that recipients of uh, nonprofits might feel like this person, this volunteer, it just doesn't feel like they really like me or understand me. They're just doing it because they want to feel good or whatever, because they think they're so good. Um, I think that could happen. I agree that that's actually um, one of the, the ben or one of the challenges with empathy is how do we how do we practice it in an authentic way that actually goes beyond benefiting our own well-being and our own view of ourselves as good people and and people who can help and make it different. Mm -hmm. So, so there is actually something that I wonder from what you're saying, um, and it actually I think it all boils down to the definition of empathy, but. Um, can you can you actually assume that somebody who pretends to be empathetic is actually, you know, uh, showing empathy? Uh, and so, how do you actually define empathy? Well, that's interesting, and I'm actually really curious to hear what Chris has to say. But um, but I like that idea of, of, of if somebody's pretending, <laughs> what does that mean? Because obviously, I help to I I design programs to help people practice empathic skills. I try to I try to share with people that even though some of us there is a genetic component. Some of us have more natural tendency toward, uh, you know, ease and comfort with being empathic. 
um, it is something that you can learn as a skill. And, you know, I think that's, uh, that's interesting. Like, what does it feel like for the recipient when somebody's practicing <laughs> their empathy on that person? Um, anyway, I define it in, there, there, there are so many definitions of empathy and actually what you asked is actually the heart of the issue, I think, with a lot of these debates that, that we can have uh, that me and Fritz and other scholars have had about pros and cons of empathy. And, and we really do need to define it. In fact, I'm at this point now in my career where I'm wondering if we should even use the word anymore because mm -hmm. there are specific things that kind of are under the empathy umbrella that I wouldn't even call empathy. And even some of the couple things that Fritz was referring to, I wouldn't call it empathy. So to me, empathy is, is first, by foremost, it's about the other person. So it's focused on the other person and the other person's needs and experiences and their well-being. So any any definition that doesn't include that is not, to me, is not an empathic and other oriented response. Fritz mentioned a couple of uh, things, uh, both cognitive and emotional aspects of empathy. And generally, social psychologists see it that way too. So uh, for the cognitive aspects, um, there are many different ways you can you can practice empathy sort of with a little bit of effort through imagination, for example, through just trying to uh, uh, see, imagine what another person is feeling and thinking or what their world perspectives might be like given their situation in life. Um, you can also, another cognitive form of empathy is simply reading people, right? So looking for your head nod, I can see your head nod, Victoria, and, and your smile, Fritz, right? So just noticing people's faces and body language and, and, and little subtle cues, tone of voice, um, mannerisms, all these different things we can do. It's almost like being a detective of the other person's experience. But one of the problems, of course, I think, I'm sorry, I'm gonna argue a point for Fritz right now. One of the problems with that kind of empathy is that it can be easily used to manipulate people, right? So it's just it's just a skill and it can be trained and it can be used to get what you want from others. And I think a lot of people in sales know this and use it for that purpose. So I, I like to think that we need two solid uh, psychopaths also are, are do fine on this uh, um, on this aspect of empathy. Um, so I think that empathy, like good empathy, the, the more positive aspect of empathy have both the cognitive aspects and the emotional aspects, but one kind. So there are two kinds of emotional aspects, at least, maybe more. And one is the more, the shared experience kind of, right? The, that can be great sometimes because sharing an experience that's uplifting and amazing. So like often we are watching a show or reading a book, we can feel this sense of elevation, right? From something that's inspiring. But it can also be pretty harmful if, say, for example, in the case of the doctor, the experience you're sharing multiple times a day, one after another, without breaks, is someone's absolute distress or, or pain, right? Suffering of other people. And that you're feeling what they're feeling. Actually, I see that as not really empathy. That's sort of an unhealthy sort of uh, transparency or, or overlap that doesn't really have a boundary. Um, there's a little bit of that, I think, no matter what. I think we all feel a little bit of resonance. And that helps to maybe to motivate more complex forms of empathy. But, but the one that seems to be the most protective, including for doctors against burnout, is um, compassion. So feeling care for that other person, right? It's being able to kind of step outside of your own like discomfort or distress over their suffering and being able to sit with them and be able to not take on their suffering, but be there for them. And it's really, it's a very complex thing to be able to regulate our own emotions. But Nancy Eisenberg's work shows that, you know, certain children are pretty good at this early on. And the children who are able to regulate their own emotions are also the ones who are who are able to show compassion and, and help and they set aside their own kind of feelings of being overwhelmed um getting back to the doctors um so the burnout doctor research it's specifically compassion again that, that's protective but but the research also shows that the personal distress response is associated with more burnout so this thing that some people call empathy is is bad in this one case but this thing that some people call empathy is good in this other case. And I think that's part of the issue and why we're so confused sometimes about what empathy's effects are, because we don't even know what it is sometimes. But Fritz, I'm curious to hear what you think about definition. Um, thank you, thank you. I mean, and and uh, also thank you, thanking you here for giving this balanced view of also including already uh, hinting at some of the dubious aspects here. Um, I'll, I'll go to the same two questions here in the same order here and I will basically repeat most of the things that Sarah said with slight changes here. So the course question, I mean, Victoria's question was here to say um, which um, effects does it have on a person when they think someone else has empathy for them? 
Um, so this perception of empathy is very powerful. I mean, indeed. Um, now, perception of empathy does not mean real empathy, of course. So th this is one thing. We know, for, uh, talking about our, going to the case of the medical doctors, that when a patient perceives that the doctor, thinks that the doctor has empathy um, with them, um, that they are more likely to do what, what she says. They will be more likely to take the medicine that she prescribes, which is excellent. We know that actually this, is, this has an immediate positive benefit. 50% of patients don't take medicine as prescribed, including in cases of cancer. This is probably the biggest factor, a cost factor even in the, in the medical health sector, that people are very, um, used to be called non-compliant as if it was a top-down ordering system. Um, but um, that is still, that's a stunning number. But in the cases where people perceive that the doctor has empathy, they're much more likely to take the medicine and that, okay, there can be cases where doctors err, but usually they actually like, they know what medicine is the good one and how to take it and give you the right order. So it, it, it has a huge benefit uh, in that case. That doesn't mean that it's real empathy, of course, and this, this is where the whole thing comes of, in, of playing a show. I mean, there is a huge show of empathy um, um, that sociopaths and um, not to go to full extreme or psychopaths, whatever the difference may be, um, manage. Um, so there becomes this whole apparatus of controlling um, what emotions we show, how we want to influence them. This is, this is a machinery of propaganda, of kind of wanting to manipulate other people. Sometimes, of course, manipulating other people for their own benefit. I mean, I'm sure that doctors who understand this logic, they, they play full empathy, um, knowing that this will help the patient. So I'm not against this. I think this is, this is actually good if they do it well, um, um, they use it for a good purpose. But of course, it also means that anyone else can use it with other intention with negative ones. Where I would say that ultimately, is this now on the balance, is this good or bad for empathy? You can't say, it's both. It depends whatever goal you use it for. So it's not a point for that. Teachers, professors with students, very similar. I'm sure that there's a lot of that too. Some is also of just, time, of course, spending time with someone. And, he, and, and Sarah and I 100% agree here on the side, what is really important is actually something that we may or may not call empathy, whatever we call it, it's attention to the other. Listening well, listening well, perceiving, asking questions. I mean, empathy is not just like an observer spot. It's, it's really something like, um, yeah relating to others in an active way, seeking them out, sometimes overcoming some kind of things to say, well, should I ask a question or not or reach out or so. That is, that is what I'm extremely interested in too. And I really um, want to know how we can get to that point that that is possible and whether social media reach, allow this or not. And those are the questions that we have to ask here. Um, definitions of empathy in this regard. Um, I, I mean, yes, I agree with Sarah's definitions here. I do still tr want to emphasize this uh, aspect of sharing not just feelings and situations, but this, what I would stress as an experience. One of the interesting things of empathy for me here is that um, sharing means that there's a certain clarity of what we perceive from the other. Um, not everything, of course, is um, clear. So sometimes you, some people don't show emotions or you don't know the situation they're in. Often the situation, knowing the situation can help you or showing the emotions of someone can be clear. And if, if nothing of that happens, it's very hard to figure out what's going on with other people. So we are more likely to perceive something like empathy when there's a either clear situation or a clear show of an emotion. And show of an emotion, I don't mean negative. It's more like a it's not just an inner feeling that may be hidden, but a displayed emotion. Um, so we're talking about something that has to do with clarity too. Um, it's a communicative um, aspect and that clarity allows us then to move our mobile consciousness in it and kind of be part of that. Suddenly the situation becomes clear, but it also means of course that we only have empathy. This is again, one of the limitations when these things are met, when the situation is clear, is purified, is maybe presented from one person to another. And some people are bad at that. Some people are not good at making a case for what their situation is. They may not understand it themselves. Um, 
and and others may then not pick it up. So empathy is not in itself a fair kind of business. Um, it's there's a lot of um, parts that go into it. The listening skills that Sarah emphasizes, they can get over that if you are listening well to it, but that's not something that comes easy. This is not something that that is tricky. Um, by itself, empathy, I, I, this is, again, I would say the more intuitive empathy, not the practiced empathy sides, um, leads to one-sidedness and, and lopsidedness on many levels, including polarization, of course. So Fritz, what, what I think is really interesting and I like about what you're saying is, is you're focusing on how empathy is, like we often talk about empathy like it's in this one person, right? Or not, right? But you're saying, no, 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 empathy is actually between. Mm -hmm. It's like actually created in, within interactions and that's very similar to Jamil Zaki's uh, work on em empathy, how he says it's, there's this interpersonal nature of it that we kind of ignore, but he finds that people who are more expressive, they do get more benefits because people can understand them better as a result. It yep. makes the empathy easier for the em empathic person they're interacting with. Um, so, you know, as, and as you point out, empathy can be quite challenging, right? It really depends on the situation and the person. And it, it's actually a, it could be a mentally taxing type of thing to do or more intuitive. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, yeah, that's very, that's very interesting. I, I wish we would disagree more, but you know, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, or maybe, yeah, sorry. Go oh, no, 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 you, you go. No, no. <laughs> no. I, I was going to say, maybe you're going to disagree on the next subject, because okay. um, now we need to talk about technology. Uh, and Sarah, you said something surprising um, that you found that social media doesn't cause a decrease of empathy, but in, in case sometimes increases it. Uh, and I find that very interesting. And so in that case, I wanted to ask both of you how technology may help empathy or harm it. Yeah, so I, I just want to clarify, it's not necessarily, we don't really know causally what social media does because we don't have a world where we can give half half of yeah. people like social media right and the others are like in this other control group but but just there's some evidence suggesting that even though we might believe that social media uh, it, it impairs our empathy it, it does you know it that may not be the case because uh, somehow it, the people who are using social media are also the empathic people um, i'm sure they use it differently but anyway Fritz, what do you think about technology and empathy well um <sighs> I mean, the first thing is that we have to be careful to not to fall into traps of quickly condemning change. This is an old tendency. So, so here for my um, realm and here I'm putting on partly my humanity set again, it is very interesting to see that there is this old stereotype that the uh, older generations always condemn the new technologies and the new media. And so 200 years ago, which is a period that I studied, um, everyone was up in arms that something that we now would call empathy would be destroyed by a new technology and a new medium. Um, everyone said, I mean, the pedagogues, the, uh, so the teachers, the professors, the priests and the politicians all thought this will be horrible. What they were talking about was the novel. Um, they thought the novel would be making everyone turn into everyone into solipsists, individuals just reading books and not connected to the world and others any longer. Um, they <laughs> predicted a huge loss of sympathy, which we now would call empathy in it. Nowadays, of course, we want our kids to read more novels, so to have more empathy. So this is the certain paradox about it. So I'm using that example to clarify that I would say in the case of social media, first of all, we're talking about lots of different things, but I want to be careful to not jump in it with assumptions. Just because it's new, it doesn't mean it's bad. <laughs> That sounds it sounds obvious, but it sometimes needs to be said when you read what is when you read the media debates. So my for me, the, the challenges that I see, um, the positive sides, of course, there's a lot of a lot of more things are available. You can connect with more people, you are up to date with, with your friends or people you know a little bit, you get to know them better. Um, the challenges for me are on the level of the speed. Um, Good things take time, including empathy or empathy, the related kind of things. And um, yes, speed is also relative. We adapt a lot of things. We can squeeze. Time is not just kind of a same. It doesn't have just one kind of clear rhythm or so. It can condense and so on and so on. But that's what I'm really concerned about, this very quick in and out. And in social media that works that way, people seem to go very quickly from one person to the next, go through some emotional arc, but then no, it's coming to an end. 
so one of the things that I'm very interested in is the triggers of empathy. And one of the interesting triggers of empathy is to know that it will end. You are more likely to engage with someone else when you can predict that it's a short or it will be a limited case. There's also empirical evidence for that showing people a picture of someone suffering and then you change the text below to say, hey, this person is terminal ill or this is an acute illness, they will be better soon. And then you ask people how likely they are to, willing to engage with them. But I think this works, this explains what works so well in fiction. Fiction promises an end. Um, Suzanne Keen, who was here last week, actually um, knows a lot about these aspects that the part of the promise of fiction is this structure of introduction, but also an ending. You know it ends. Social media often um, are working very, and media in general, often work very well with that structure. You know, oh yeah, there's an end, I have control of this and so on. So I kind of, my, my fear a little bit is that that, that, that expectation that it's short-lived will become part of our culture that at empathy, yes, you jump in, you might get active, donate money, but it ends. So I want to know what Sarah has to say on these things. I know that Sarah has very differentiated views about these things and also has a lot of interesting data about this. So I do not know what the trends are that we know about these things. I mean, so that's kind of- I think really it, interesting in this, like, this idea of, because we just talked about this relational model of empathy and of course with relationships, you it's a good relationship, you don't, Yes. You don't want them to end, and, and also one of the, I think, signs or at least contributions to a good relationship is that you have mutual empathy and mm -hmm. care, right? Empathic concern, uh, compassion, and, and you can take your perspective or at least lean in and ask questions if you don't understand them. Mm -hmm. So so that's like, it seems at odds with what you're saying, that if you're saying you can feel, you feel more empathy or technology can help us feel more empathy if we know it, like, it's done soon. It's I mean, I, for me, one of the things about technology that can can impair empathy is that there's there are so many opportunities that that it can be too much right so it's a little bit related to what you're saying mm -hmm. um like of course we have the core people we normally empathize with and interact with and have all those practices developed um with over time but then now we're exposed to somebody we've never we have no idea how to process because we don't have the experience and and then another person the same day and then we like look at the news and we see this person and then we our social media we see these five people who are saying this thing that we don't agree with and it just kind of it kind of gets you into this overactive short-term mode that that isn't beneficial whereas i think say when it comes to the different political attitudes or whatever i don't think it really works well online usually right you just see this person on your social media saying something that you just totally disagree with and you're just like oh i'm going to block them or i'm going to mute them or do something or you say something bad to them and then they say something back to you but a lot of that's happening with technology and um, and, uh, and yet I think you can have relationships with people who are very different than you, um, sort of in the real world, but through sort of structured regular interactions that are kind of not very emotional, right? Like maybe it's, uh, maybe it's some, somebody you're doing something with regularly, like a, a volunteer job or a colleague that you have to do a task with or something like that. And, and over time, you just understand that you just, you agree to disagree and it doesn't feel as as toxic because you know other things about that person to humanize them. And it's harder to do that with technology, I think. It's like it's easier to to just know like a stereotype, right? I know this person's name, I know their group category, and this is what they said on social media. And and that's so that's I think that can make us that can challenge our empathy. And of course, of course, there's some building blocks of empathy, the relational aspect of it. Like we can't look at each other's eyes right now. Like you might feel like I'm looking in your eyes, but that isn't what it feels like to me, right? Um, and I want to see your eyes. I want to have eye contact. It's actually really important for coming from the mother infant parent infant uh, bond of just how the fundamental connection in humans and what that does to our brains and, and how that helps us feel close and, and be open and feel safe often. Um, so, so that's like one major negative for technology, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, lastly, I would like to ask you both if you would have any recommendation on how to teach or promote the development of empathy. Okay. Oh, I, I, okay, I made a mistake. I didn't turn my microphone off. So I guess the question goes to me first here. So, <laughs> um, okay, I'll, 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 but I, I will be brief here. Um, this, two things that I would stress. And um, in I, I, Sarah is the expert on this question. So that's why I really want to be brief to set her up, but she can 
decide whether or not to um, react to that. The first thing is, um, I very strongly believe in the role of narrative thinking in that process of temporal developments um, of other people. Um, they're not just in frozen in a spot and we understand them. No, there is something like going along with the journey with someone. So for me, teaching of empathy um, is um, very strongly connected with um, experience that ha have to do with narratives, literary fiction, but also narratives that come out of other media. It doesn't have to be kind of the traditional English class where you read text, but it is an ability that I would say I would stress in also the active storytelling and retelling, just retelling, retelling a novel from the perspective of one character, retelling it from the perspective of another one. Those are things I would definitely want to say, I want to have people practice it. The second part is time. Um, you heard me kind of being a little bit um, afraid about the acceleration of our time. So here, so here I'm echoing Hartmut Rosa, who was here in our group two weeks ago. Um, that acceleration is something we take very have to take seriously. What will this do? And technology, of course, is the medium of acceleration in our age here right now. So one part of that is to revisit stories, stories that people know, narratives they've had, or kind of cases where they had empathy with someone to follow up on this. Don't see that as a one-time kind of thing. Don't just do some moral licensing, just clapping yourself on the shoulder for doing good quickly one time or so, but follow, train duration. Try to have people build long-term relationships. Those are the two aspects that I would stress. Yes, I, I agree, actually. I think that the stories are very important. Um, uh, and I especially like it, it just keeps coming back to the in the context of relationships, right? I think that's what you're, I mean, both of those things that the retelling of the story and, and seeing it unfold over time. And you can do it with, of course, with with fiction and with uh, other types of uh, types of the arts. And it's just something that naturally happens as you get to know people too, over time. Um, and, and I also agree that the, uh, the issue with technology isn't technology itself. It, we can use it for many different ways. It's just a tool, like a hammer, you can use to, to, to break something or to build something. Um, but it's the fact that that some of the ways that newer technology are designed do, do have more shallow sort of too many types of things in too little time. And we don't have a chance to do some of the basic building blocks of empathy. Like as you already mentioned, one of them is active listening. And active listening isn't just like hearing. It's, it's actively trying to understand this person's perspective, like reflecting back what they're saying. And, and, and you don't always agree, of course, but, but just really seeing, trying to see if you understand the way they see things. Um, and and that's, that's not something that is like intuitive. It's something that you, takes time and, and a little work and um, we don't always get it right. So I think another thing to, to work on for when we're trying to train empathy is some humility about our own empathic capacity, um, and, and not just our own, I mean, people's, humans. Like there's some really good work by uh, Nicholas Epley at Chicago on um, perspective, he calls it perspective mistaking, I think he calls it, very clever, but just showing that, you know, we, with perspective taking, when we're trying to read others, like we're not always accurate and we should be aware of that. And when we're tra trying to train people to be better at compassion and care, we need to teach them that they should actively engage and ask questions and don't assume things about other people. And you can't always ask questions about people who are not with you in the moment uh, via technology. You see, we see those snapshots of people, as you say, you don't have enough time. Um, but you could, you could play an imaginative game where you are engaging in sort of a Q&A, even with, you know, I do it when I'm reading novels, of course. I want to know, I kind of engage with that character outside of the actual text. I want to know more about that character. And you can, we can use our imaginations and we can do that. But it is a process that puts a lot of on us. Uh, and I think one of the major issues with trying to train empathy is like motivation. Like people have to want to become empathic. Yes, you can train this, some skills. Yes, you can, there are a few pieces that you can improve in people. But if people don't value it or think it's something they want, you, it's what's the point? You know, that's not actually it's not empathic to, to try to force people to be empathic. I don't think. Anyway, 
we had a lot of questions it looks like so maybe we need to we absolutely do yeah <laughs> so i'm gonna read the first question um by sammy um, do you define characterize empathy in a real life situation the same way as in a digital situation Should I start? This is for both of us, I think. Um, um, I think in many cases, of course, there will be similar things will be activated, but the, I mean, there's the, uh, I stress in this case, the differences at this point, but that might be um, partly because I'm probably not quite as digital as some other people. Um, so when I am in a real situation, um, I know that the pressure is 100% on me to react. Um, there is, um, so I'm, I'm part of the situation. And, I'm, I'm, and, and when I'm part of a situation, um, I'm called upon. There's, there's nothing that, um, there's no excuse for me not to react, whatever it is. And if, if I fail to react in a certain way, I know I will replay this. I will try to figure out, okay, I did something wrong to kind of make up for that. Um, whatever it was, um, and that this both this pressure to react and this hauntingness of it is somewhat different in the virtual world. Um, it might be maybe I'm just self-excusing myself um, because I feel like I, often I don't fully understand the situation. If there's a real person on the other end of the screen, there may be situation things I don't understand. I don't see the situation the same way. Um, if it is a mediated story where kind of a, I'm getting a product of uh, that comes through the news or so. Um, I'm also much more detached from it and I don't feel like it, it is addressed to anyone and no one. It's not calling on me. Um, so that's a, this is a very simple answer, but, but I still feel like more I'm not called upon um, the same way. Yeah, I think in, I agree. And, and, and in, in technology interactions, we often, as you say, we don't have the same amount of cues that we might use in a face to face interaction to try to build empathy. But I, I want to also say that in the real world, when we have all the cues available, there are many times that our empathy fails many, many times. And some work on virtual reality might be helpful. I actually think that that um, part of the thing about empathy is the work that what really matters is actually being willing to to go through that process of of like I've decided I'm going to care and I'm going to try and and that's that's a beginning at least other for all the limitations of it. Um, so in virtual reality work, you would expect that the more immersed we get into this world, the better we would get at empathy. But our recent research, a meta analysis that looks at all known published studies on this topic, actually it finds that probably like other types of media, I would assume that. Um, that being immersed in this in this environment actually makes us feel the feelings. So we feel like we see this little child who's experiencing a refugee situation and we feel for her. But it doesn't because we're being handed it on a platter. Actually, like we're, we're giving all the empathic stuff right in front of us. It actually doesn't make us do the cognitive work. So actually, I think sometimes technology, if we're motivated, can make us do some extra work, right? We have to read between the lines. Like you get a text message from somebody and they say something and you're, maybe your immediate reaction is like, that's rude. But then you're like, well, wait, no, no, no. Like, is this a joke? Uh, or is this person just like, maybe maybe they're drinking right now. Are they drinking right now? You know, like go through all these different things of like what's happening. And then you figure out how do I like negotiate this? But you can see it takes a lot more. It's not always pleasant for us because we're, because it would it'd be nice if it was just like, you know, easy. and. And we can just go with the flow, right? But sometimes it, that's part of why people sometimes love to hate technology is because it makes us uh, do a little more, a little more of the work of empathy is on us. Uh, and, and it's not, and we don't have like the, you know, the basic biological stuff like eye contact and like even the hormones around, you know, like that are facilitating our, our, our bodies, even like the fact that a lot of empathy has to do with physical resonance, right? The way you move, I start to mirror you without even knowing I'm doing that. And that helps us feel the sense of shared experience that you talked about at the beginning, Chris. So I think that technology can, you know, it's like, it's complicated, but sometimes it, put, it, it can help to build sort of a long enduring, a stronger enduring form of empathy. But like, God, 
there's so much going on. And sometimes people just don't have the energy or motivation to, to actually want to engage that way. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. I mean, yeah. Just the one line about virtual reality here too. Um, and I'm agreeing with Sarah here because there was a lot of hope connected with that, that they will teach us empathy. But I think this mode of being a player in a way where you become the avatar for someone else's life in some situations. So, so that can take away something very crucial in empathy, which is also that you're still outside of the other. Um, so they, of course, virtual reality can be used in many ways. I'm sure there's interesting ways. So, but I'm just wanting to say this, if you slip too directly into the shoes of another person, you take away the empathy part. You, you, you become the, the driver and you're not trying to make sense of the other person any longer. Um, and by the way, I'm actually kind of surprised how you read my text messages. No. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I promise next... not to tell them, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is from Ben Rosenzweig, uh, who asks, is it possible or useful to distinguish between empathy and theory of mind? Can you then define fake empathy as using theory of mind to mimic what is normally an empathetic response? That's, a, that's an interesting question, and I, I admit that my, I haven't done much research on theory of mind except for that I see it as it is kind of under the empathy umbrella I talked about when I defined empathy. So it's more of like the cognitive part, and it's when people are aware of, can understand other people, that other people have different desires than them and other different preferences than them. And so, for example, people on the autism spectrum, children, uh, sometimes have difficulty understanding that, um, although it, that's also debatable a little bit. But in any case, it's just, it, to me, it's one kind of form, right? It's, and I think it points to an important part of the empathy umbrella, which is that it's not just based on similarity and resonance, but it's based on an awareness and space for difference. And for the fact that I can't assume that everybody sees the world the way I do, and that a healthy theory of mind can, can envision that another person sees things differently. Um, and uh, the part about fake empathy, could you repeat that, please? Mm, sorry. Excuse me, I was just replying to another oh, <laughs> question. <laughs> it's fine. Um, yeah, so the question was, can you then define fake empathy as using theory of mind to mimic what is normally an empathetic response? I think I, I think that's hard for me. It's just hard for me to answer that question because it's like, because, because of, it's like, I don't know if it's fake if you're trying to, if you're genuinely trying to um, understand another person, even if it's not natural for you, I don't think it's fake. I think, I think that there's, you know, if, if I would just label it as somebody practicing theory of mind or somebody practicing perspective taking rather than not necessarily saying whether it's real or fake. And I think the motivation behind it matters, but I don't know, Chris, what do you think? It's a hard question and a good question. So thank you for yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, first point, I agree about theory and mind and let's say empathic care as being separate. Um, neuroscientists now are basically have confirmed five or six times that um, when people engage in theory of mind, I mean, of one person understanding what is going on in the mind of another, they use one kind of uh, routine of activation patterns in the brain that does hardly overlap with what we would call empathic um, concern or emotion sharing. Um, which means that we really have at least at least two completely separate pathways to um, something that we could still call empathy. Although it's a question whether we even should call it by one name in that case. So, and that's Sarah talked about the need for definitions here and how that actually impairs some research. Um, so very important to understand this. I, of course, in practice, they often do overlap. The one can trigger to the other. We should also not downplay that. So there's a reason why we actually call them both empathy because if you understand the feelings of another, very often, actually, they affect you. You suddenly feel them too and stuff like that. So that one flips to the other um, and that should not be downplayed. The fake question about the fake part is, of course, for me, quite important in this. Um, so I actually, um, and it, there's two sides of the fake. There's the one thing where you you pretend to be empathetic. This is a sociopath, the manipulative person. Um, and it's also something that is um, part of culture. You so show emotions 
because you want to impress other people. I mean, you, you want something from other people by communicating your emotions. That doesn't have to be fake or manipulative, but there's a side where you learn that, oh, if I show certain emotions, I get a certain reaction. Mm, does it make it fake? No, but it becomes something that you use. You start to utilize the reaction you get out of other people, um, which can also then lead you to show certain emotions more because, hey, they elicit the response you like to have and so on and so on. So it's a kind of a very quick, uh, slippery slope here. Um, there's another side of the fake empathy now where I would say uh, where you're self-deceived. You think you have empathy, but what you have is actually something really horrible. It could be this vampiristic empathy, or it could be this, what I call the false hero identification. You think you have empathy with these people in need, but in reality, you identify with a grandiose helper figure who then reaches out to other people. Um, so you produce a self-image that you like, that is beneficial for you um, and looks good in the world. Um, and, and then um, could be called empathy, which has become a great label in the last 10 years. So we, we shouldn't forget that. I mean, there's something about empathy now. Obama liked it. He embraced it publicly, very famously, and so on. That now can lead to, to include empathy in this vogue washing, um, where you want to show empathy to impress people college applications. I have kids, kids in that age and stuff like that. I mean, suddenly all these kids discover their empathy. I mean, it's amazing. And, and that has effects. I mean, this is, this is something where I would say, hmm, it, it, it uh, affects all these surveys about um, um, rating yourself on empathy and so on, because you want to look good in the world. And you know that nowadays you brag about empathy. Um, that was different 30 years ago. Um, nowadays you can brag about it. It's competitive. I mean, Sarah and I had some discussions about this before this, and we, we decided to call this competitive empathy, where you show and signal empathy. So again, is this, this, this real or not? Well, you overemphasize it. Um, and that can be another form of faking empathy. Signal and also, I just want to say that when you interact with people like that, it's so annoying, right? <laughs> I mean, no, really, because it's like, because, because like, that's why I think the humility thing matters. Like, Let's admit we don't always get it right, you know, and like we can try, but but there's ways that we fail and that what we try to do is repair when we make mistakes, right? But none of us are the superheroes that are making the difference. They're gonna gonna be the ones who know everything and of how to do well, how to do good and how to how to make people's lives better. And so I at least personally, maybe there you go, you just found one of my triggers. Like I don't <laughs> like these competitive empathy thing. I, I do like uh, sincere, I like sincere empathy, right? People trying and and if you, you know, you can practice it and you can be doing it mindfully, like I'm going to try to listen right now carefully. Uh, I don't think that's fake though. Anyway, but you, you, you brought up some good points. And I think the idea of, can we really know how empathic we, we are, right? Like, how can we really know that? Or, or are we fooling ourselves when we say we're empathic? I think those are really good points. Thank you very much. So the next question is from Mark Weiner and I'm going to allow them to talk. All right, thank you. Uh, I my question uh, takes off from something that Fritz just uh, referred to. Uh, Fritz said that he wondered if these two ways of responding to someone could both be called empathy, and that's very much what I was wondering a little earlier when I was wondering whether there really is a fundamental difference between an act of empathy that occurs automatically or spontaneously and one that is a result of a learned skill, the kind of empathic act that Sarah uh, was discussing. Are they truly the same thing or can they, uh, and that is, to say, can they even be referred to through the same term of empathy? It's kind of a basic question, I guess. I, I think that's a really good question. And it really does show that you've been actively listening to us. Thank you. Um, and, and I think, yeah, I think it's, it's I, I, we can each have opinions of that. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Um, I think, like I said earlier, that the idea, the word we use, empathy, it covers so many different things, including these, these two, the more intuitive versus the practice skill. 
that I wonder if the word is useful. And maybe we should just say, talk about specifically what we mean rather than using the word empathy. Um, but some people still might want to, and I don't know what you think on this, Chris or, or Mark, what you think, but, but I, don't, I don't think there's gonna be a right or wrong answer here. Um, I, I'll, um, we want to hear more questions. There's actually a lot of questions, but I agree with um, Mark, first of all, that that actually is a very interesting question. Um, and I actually would say, yes, I, I, um, there is a difference. Um, it might be not the empathy itself that is so different, but the way how, how it unfolds. Um, the spontaneous empathy, um, I think we all experience um, and it, it's very powerful, sweeps over. But I think in the learned kind of case, um, and I call this the architecture of empathy, it's not just about having empathy or not, it's about blocking and filtering and channeling empathy. We already know where this is going. We have the schema in mind uh, of how it will and um, um, how it will develop and what it will lead to, and we know how to behave there. And I think that's actually quite interesting. I think we are quite often in this second space um, of building on experiences where we will only feel empathy if something breaks through our blocking kind of mechanisms there. Um, and so, so they, there is something about it that all these spontaneous cases lead us to develop more expectations. So for me, that, that is quite interesting. Um, well, first, what you said just made me think. This is really interesting because it, it brings back to, us back to technology. And I think what's happening with the some of the technology mechanisms is that it's kind of an arms race of empathy. Like what's going to catch your attention? What's going to break through your, your typical uh, barriers you might have or protective barriers to empathy? And it's going to be the more extreme emotional case, the more extreme story, right? And it's just like then you're, you kind of see a lot of the. I don't know if you ever see these these heartwarming stories in, in the news or whatever through social media, but you end up sort of escalating, right? And I think COVID has been a time where you do see a lot of these stories, which which I think are helpful because they do break through. Um, but but it's like, you know, maybe the maybe sometimes we have those protective layers for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I 100% agree. I mean, for me, that's like, I, get, I call, talk about this as a three step process of being very empathetic, ha having these blocks in place, learning the blocks to, to kind of control this, and then nevertheless admitting at empathy trigger selectively. I mean, that's kind of the learning model that I have there. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. So we still have a bunch of questions to cover. <laughs> we still have four of them. So the next one is for Fritz. Um, it's from Claire. You mentioned some alternatives to empathy, ethics, rational thinking that might better improve society. Is that one key idea you find less limiting than empathy in the general aim of improving the world, helping others, decreasing suffering? Do you find that the darker sides of empathy might be more amplified through technologies that other ideas like rational thinking might not be? Thank you. Um, thank you. And th this is, of course, th this is the weak part, maybe the uh, maybe a strong part, but a weak part of my own thinking here is that I don't have a single alternative. I can't say, oh, let's uh, let's stump out empathy and let's put in my new hero here, let's say, um, whether that's rational thinking or ethics or something else, the V feeling that I also feel like is very important in that. Um, I don't have that. Now, I can make that into a certain positive kind of, or try to pretend there's a strength in this, is which is to say, it's not enough to kind of go with one thing. We need a lot of different forces here. Yes, I, I do believe empathy is a very, very important part to play. It also suits us as human beings very well. But we also need to have some possibility to bring in rationality, to sometimes see, hey, we're getting manipulated here. We're sweeping into one kind of side, and that's not the right choice here. Um, but then we also, we, this is kind of could be an ethical thinking, but then there's also has to be something like a basic solidarity. So, um, so for me, it's kind of, I'm at least see it as a minimum, we need a triangle, not a single kind of concept or so. Um, and narrative thinking and mobility of consciousness for me are also other ones of these alternatives here. So empathy has to be in sync with other things, but can't be the, the single thing. That's 
it's not the most powerful answer. Maybe I'll come up with something at some point, but I haven't found it yet. I'm still looking. Thank you. And the next question is for Sarah. Uh, so you talked about doctors using compassion to avoid empathetic burnout, perhaps also with politics. With your understanding of empathy, what are some real life situations where we should always strive for empathy rather than sympathy, compassion, niceness, et cetera? How good is empathy at alleviating polarization? Well, so that, I mean, that's again, like, so when this is like a great question, and it just points to the fact that we do have all these other words that we use, right? Like empathy, sympathy, compassion. So it always depends on what kind of empathy do you think I would recommend? And I think that we need to have the cognitive empathy, so that skill set, that attempt, right, where we're like reading the situation in the person and the listening, along with the feeling, the genuine feeling of compassion and care. Um, but actually, I, I like Chris's perspective on we add an element of rationality as well. So we do understand that sometimes these can be used so that, for example, like one of the limitations of, of advocating for empathy at all costs at all times is that, uh, you know, it does have like this one side effect, at least more, morally speaking, that, that if you are focusing your empathy on a particular person, you might give them preferential treatment, which then conflicts with the moral uh, principle of fairness. So, so you, so it's good to be able to say, Hey, like, this is what I'm doing. And, and you know what, when, when it's for my daughter, uh, if she's sick, I need to do that as a parent, right? I need to actually have a bias in favor of her empathically um, and, and try to do what I can to take care of her. That's actually how we've evolved as creatures to, to be good uh, caretakers. But, but if it's when it comes to her getting preferential treatment, uh, say in public school, like that's not fair. Right. And so, so I shouldn't be a helicopter parent and try to seek some sort of extra treatment that she doesn't need or some sort of extra pre uh, preference. So I think it really depends. And I think adding other principles of morality, I, and that's what I would advocate for, not just rationality, but other moral principles and, and thinking about how they play out within various situations. Uh, I have to also say, Chris, I forgot to mention, helicopter parenting is associated with narcissism, not empathy, just got to say. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, back, focus, focus, right? Um, yeah, so I, so I can't do an extreme like empathy at all costs argument, but I can say that it's one of, uh, it's a character trait that, that has a lot of benefits and along with other types of uh, traits and, and, and rational thinking and, and measured thinking and conversations, I think is how we, we engage this issue because I think there are issues with extreme rationality too, actually. Like uh, that you look at uh, people as a bunch of numbers and you say there's, um, you know, we should save a thousand lives so we can kill this one person here. Uh, so a thousand lives are saved. That's classic utilitarian reasoning. And for some people that really resonates, but, but you know, it's, it's a complex moral issue actually. And, and there can be different perspectives on it. Um, and, and so, but, but, you know, sort of like the rational perspective is, is to, to save the more people, right. And treat people like we're a bunch of numbers and not individuals, but you know, what if that person who has to be killed for the greater good is like someone you love or whatever. I mean, it's complicated, but the point is having conversations like this is pretty helpful because we can see that there is a middle ground, actually. It's not as extreme as, you know, being for all the time or being against all the time. It's about thinking about, is this the right time in the right context? Chris, what do you think? I want to throw one thing back to you. I don't think narcissism and empathy are opposites at all. I think narcissists quite often um, are quite good at empathy. They, they use it differently. It could be self-empathy and so on. So I want to be a little bit careful on that side. And helicopter parents can be both narcissists and use empathy in that process. Or okay, I'm just, yeah, that's interesting because I just, they're negatively correlated in social science research using self-reports, but you know, we know the problems with that. But um, but uh, yeah, I could, I could see that. Actually, I study how narcissistic people give. So I'm not saying they're not pro-social. They do give and they do help. They just, they just actually don't think it's important to do it because you care for like empathetic reasons. But now we're totally shifting. We still have so many questions, so. Yes, you <laughs> have two more questions. <laughs> Two more questions that I really hope we, we get to both of them. So the, the next one is from Ryan Best. And it's basically about the connection between attention and empathy. Uh, so 
um, they are relating it to, you know, your comment, Sarah, on active listening, for instance. So is there a connection? What is the connection between empathy and attention? Uh, actually, I think Fritz mentioned this directly. Fritz, do, what do you do? You want to share your perspective on? I think you you can reiterate what you said earlier on this. I mean, yes. For me, um, empathy and attention have a very strong link. And what is interesting here, maybe that allows me to come back to these different forms of um, empathy. Each form of empathy guides our attention to different aspects of other people. Um, the cognitive empathy is so much focused on understanding of others. Um, the co-experience of the situation of another guides our attention to events. I mean, the big meaningful events in someone's life. Um, the um, empathic concern guides us to um, kind of the, the concerns of another person. I mean, where they're squeezed by something, um, even if they're not an outright trouble. And the neuroscientific definition of empathy of um, direct emotion sharing guides us to strong, intense, immediate emotions. So, um, so it goes both ways. Um, we have I mean, these these forms of empathy that we cultivate and that we cultivate to different degrees, of course, um, guide our attention to those kind of things. So some people will be more kind of looking in the one direction or the other side, and then they see it more, of course. I mean. You see what you expect. But it's also then, of course, these kind of triggers that you see in the real world activate in us these aspects. So it's um, each form of empathy has its bias, um, which then, of course, also means then, again, this I can take that to a slope to say it's a lopsided attention. And then there are some dark possibilities coming along the way here. Yeah, I, I, that's, I think you know, we agree that empathy has different forms of empathy have different forms of attention. I think there's one thing when it comes to attention, though, that we often don't think about when we think about empathy, is that some people feel very uncomfortable being observed closely. That makes them, that doesn't, like, a lot of us want it. We want to feel understood by others around us. We want them to know where we're coming from and, and have, and be gracious when we mess up. But some people just feel very uncomfortable, right, and, and don't, don't want that close examination. And so let's add more pressure on how to do empathy right and say, well, actually, if you really do it right, you're paying attention to whether they want to be paid attention to. And you're reading their cues. So they, they might, maybe they're shy or maybe they uh, have some secret they don't, wanna, they don't want you to discover, right? But uh, if you're truly uh, aware and paying attention, then you need, to, you need to take that into account as well. Thank you. And lastly, we have a question from uh, Moritz Klechtermans, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, which directly relates to the video game I study, actually, which is, do you think AI can ever be empathetic? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. I really love that question. Um. Yes, loving the question also mean, means that it's hard here. Um, so, I mean, this depends now what we expect in terms of what AI can do. Can AI understand, I mean, produce a proper accurate representation of what's going on in the mind of a person? Um, probably to an astonishingly degree, yes. I mean, in terms of diagnostics, um, AI already is doing some amazing things. And AI is, again, there's different forms of it and so on. And, um, um, but now there's this other, there is, there is this interesting aspect that, uh, aspect that for me plays such a role, which is the making of an experience. So when a person makes an experience, there is a difference between the before and after, at least on some level, a meaningful difference. Um, there is a change. It doesn't always have to kind of be changing the entire fabric of a personality, but there's something there. Um, and so when you co-experience the situation of another and you share the experience of someone else, that also makes not just, makes you understand, ah, oh, yeah, this person was like this and now they're there. It also changes the observer. And this is what is so interesting about empathy. It's, it, is a, it is a 
dialogical exchange. It does something to both sides. Um, and it doesn't have to be always a full dialogue, but it affects both sides. And AI will not change, of course. AI can register that, that something is different in that person there. But it, AI will not learn in itself. Um, it will not change itself there. So on that- So far, level, so far. So far, <laughs> yes. I mean, of course, of course, so far, so far. So so Sarah, you, you actually I, study these well, things. Well, I, no, I mean, I don't study AI, but, but actually, so I think your answer about cognitive empathy, yeah, it seems like the AI can do some cognitive empathy stuff, right? Like reading, interpreting, understanding probably getting more accurate over time. Can, can AI feel compassion? How would we know, right? But I'll tell you, there's, there's this new paper I saw this past week that, that was interesting about AI and empathy. And, and the paper found that we want AI, or not everybody, but of course, but on average, people respond more positively when the, the AI system they're interacting with uh, acts like they're caring, so, and, and when they act sort of human. An example in this case, the example was that this AI system would share something personal, which of course everyone who's interacting with it knows it's a computer. But when this AI system made a self-disclosure statement, um, that made the, the person who's interacting feel more comfortable and, and, and felt more empathy for that, that, <laughs> that system. And that this actually ties us back to Justine Castle's work on AI kind of you know, creating at least a sense of connection right maybe without the psychological experience behind it but but that when a when there's there are ai systems that are designed to mimic some empathic processes that we show to each other uh people generally appreciate it. although i think it can easily be abused and, and when large companies do it it's it's really we should watch it carefully yeah yeah in two sentences so this, um ai can have empathy once AI develops an own identity or sense of self, because then it can be affected. But in that moment, of course, AI be uh, will also become, in a sense, more dangerous on some other levels, because AI has to act more selfishly in, in the process. So for me, this is a very, very beautiful and interesting paradox, what to do about this. I believe we are close to the end of time here, though. So thank you, thank you to the audience um, 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 for these excellent and wonderful questions. There's several that I took a lot of notes, as I always do. I'm very old fan fashion. I still do use the pen and pencil, the old technology. Yeah, thank you, you know thank the novel. Yeah, the novels, the dangerous novels. Uh, thank you for Sarah. We had planned to really debate and uh, so on. So there was no blood here because we unfortunately managed to agree on so many issues. Um, um, so, so in that sense, uh, um, if anyone won this debate, it was probably Sarah because people will come away from here to say that empathy is a great thing. And and <laughs> I fear <laughs> that this is a, is, is a good outcome for us here. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, well, um, we are at the end of the time. Next week, we'll have um, Ted Chang um, um, here. He will talk about one of his stories, I believe, but no one has to read it before. He will walk us through. This is an amazing opportunity, so we'll send out a reminder, um, um, and I'm very happy that it will happen. So thank you, everyone here. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks again Bye. for your attention. Bye.